All right, everybody, I'd like to introduce our last speaker of the day before we move on to the Q&A session, and this is Steve Tomlins. He's the lead farm manager uh, at Turtle Creek Gardens, and he will also be talking about uh, industrial hemp production. Is this on? Just kidding. <laughs> Hi, my name is Steve Tomlins. I'm a certified organic farmer in Delavan, Wisconsin. We're primarily vegetable operation. Been doing that for five years there. Um, before that, in five years worth of other farming endeavors in hay and grains and dairy. Uh, this is going to just be a chronology of what I did last year. We grew both the CBD variety and grain. Um, we started trying to grow this crop because we're vegetable operations, and they're kind of circling the drain when it comes to revenue. A uh, good vegetable operation should gross 20000 an acre, and this crop looked like it could do something similar, so we decided to try it. We got started uh, uh, late in the season. We only put in 400 plants of the CBD variety, and I grew five acres of a grain crop. Let's see. Boom. There's the clones. I brought it from Colorado. So we did both crops, and... Uh, People said, why you can't make any money on grain? I said, because I want to know how this crop grows. If it's going to save the planet, it needs to start now. Or what's the problem for the last couple thousand years and ain't done it yet? So I wanted to grow it and figure it out. So what I got here is uh, on the left-hand side of that photo is uh, some vegetable ground that had corn in it two years before that and then winter squash uh, the uh, previous year of this. You can, and on the right-hand side, there's some sod ground I was turning over. It's a hay field for our cattle. We managed just backing up. We managed 100 acres of organic ground, 20s and 20s and vegetables rotation um just an, just an idea just to show you the sod ground i'm turning over just the clones being hardened off uh we brought them back stuck them on the tray put them outside hardening them off getting ready for planting this is all happening at the same time so again this is just a chronology um there's i did the mold boarding then i did the disc the old-fashioned way right oh it was rough as hell it was rough uh I had an old, I mean, the average age of our equipment is about 40 years old, and most of it I had to weld back together and make it work. I'm not kidding. <laughs> so running over this ground with that disc was a, was a challenge, but that's what it looks like if you're going to turn over saw ground if you haven't farmed. There are farmers in here, right? Yeah. This is a seed bed preparation for my typical vegetable operation. On the top, the corner there, you'll see some, probably that's lettuce. But this is what I made the beds look like for the CBD operation. I didn't use plastic, didn't have time. We do put down about 100 beds of plastic every year. We just said, oh, we got room at the end of B block. It's time to go. All right, we'll put them in. And that's kind of how we went about it. No one is going to be dealing with weeds. Again, just getting ready to put on the transplanter into that bed you just saw. That's probably one variety called uh, Trace that we got from the Green Cherry Organics in Colorado. Here's a couple ladies putting together. That's Janet, my partner, on the transplanter, and uh, Diane walking through, doing it her way, uh, just getting them put in the ground. The, the water wheel had six-inch spacing. Every 10 holes was 60 inches. We put them in at about 25 square foot per plant. Again, with the vegetable operation, anybody that does vegetables has got the right equipment and the right tenacity to get this crop growing. Um, here I am trying to figure out what the hell to do with the seed. This is a McCormick 10 chart, and you'll notice there's no hemp on that chart. <laughs> they do have the John Deere Bruns, the Van Bruns, they, they do have a hemp chart on there, but the McCormicks didn't. Um, these all have names and dates on them. I don't see the names. This is this is 5-3. That got planted on, these got planted on May 25th. This is now uh, May 31st, so this is six days later after some rain, and that's what they look like when they got planted. Trying to figure out again where to set the, 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 the grain drill. This, everybody know what a McCormick 10 is? Six inch spacing, 20 holes, 10 foot wide. I only used four holes. I planted 30 inches on center with this crop. So in there you see Gorilla Tape, and I only had four holes open. Because everybody said grow this stuff at 30 pounds an acre or so and do it at six inch spacing. And I thought, I know what weeds are going to do to me if I do that. So I'm going to try to cultivate this crop because others have done it that way. So I tried it 30-inch down spacing and just made this machine do it. And uh, as I'm figuring out what to do, I had to go back out and cult pack it now. So I am rolling this field down. So mold board, disc, and then cult pack it. And you, you, it's not real clear there, but you can see the nice, it's laying down. It's rough. It's, it's a rough, it's rough ground. So I'm already thinking, 
seed dip, seed dip, seed dip. Oh, sh crap. Right? I know it's coming. <clears throat> Just running with the cult of Packer again. This is a typical plastic operation. This, is, this ended up becoming my winter squash, but it's adjacent to this hemp crop. There's my baby right there, man. Hydro 84, 1979. And I don't know how old that McCormick 10 is, but somebody repainted it. But that's what we put it in with. Um, I actually got down and measured off and put flags in the ground every 10 feet so I can get straight rows. No GPS on that girl. <laughs> no. uh, this is what the seed looked like before it went in the crop, but in, a, in the machine. And this is five days old. This is the emergence that Brian, Brad was talking uh, Brian was talking about, um, I only put down 10 pounds an acre because of the 30 inch spacing that afforded me the ability to do that. And um, I also read a lot of the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance stuff, which is a wealth of information, and the plant after rain, which is con completely the opposite of what you do with everything else, particularly even vegetables. I can't work the ground when it's wet, so I got to get it in before it gets wet, and I plant a lot of seeds with my, uh, some of my equipment. So I had real nice emergence. Uh, here's the uh, the same timing. This is the hemp crop. You can see the weeds starting to come in. Real happy about that. These are two different genetics here. I'll talk more later. This is what this is what my uh, germination rate was on that crop at 10 pounds an acre on that old equipment. Uh, just uh, uh, at this at about at about this point of this season, I started getting giddy. It's like these girls are going to take off, right? This is fun. Um, you can, if you can kind of see lines, this, this one's harder because the light's on, but you can see the green lines. I have nice lines. If anybody's planted any kind of crops or grains, you know, when you see that and, and tornado don't come through, you're probably going to be all right. All crap. <laughs> right. When you do, when you do a mold board with an old mold board, it ain't very sharp. She's going to skip a little bit. So that sod ground had a lot of that old grass in there. And I thought, well, let's see what happens, right? This is an experiment. And, uh, oh, man, I was worried, right? <clears throat> ah, but my favorite, we do use herbicides, and it's called iron, hard, cold iron. And I, uh, this is my, alt this is an Alice Chalmers G. Anybody ever seen one of them? I use them for vegetable propagation all the time, and that, that's my uh, cedar that's on there now, but I got three different pieces of metal that I put on there, depending on what I got to cultivate, and behind it there is a, probably a bed of carrots I had just planted. But there's my uh, four-row cultivator that used to be a six-row cultivator. But the year before that, it was a two-row cultivator. So I had to weld it back together so I could do this hemp crop. Uh, the point being really was I didn't have a lot of money and didn't think you had to have a lot of money to grow this thing. And I want to see if you could do it with just what you had in the barnyard. right? A lot of expensive equipment out there. We didn't have it. But I had a welder, and I usually fix everything that I break. And I try to do it before you find out. So that was my cultivator, a Danish tine. You know, reconfigured the whole thing to work on them 30-inch rows. Most of those, anybody that's ever worked with them knows that, uh, yeah. This is, uh, this, is the six, this is 615. I planted this on 64. So this is 10 days old. And I know I'm going to be overtaken. This particular one-acre spot had a weed load in it from winter squash grown organically on plastic, which means there's just weeds everywhere, right? So I knew I'd have a weed load here, so I, I wanted to cultivate this thing. But I couldn't set that guide wheel down in that cultivator. So I got a three-point hitch back there, and it took me seven hours to do this five acres. But I got it done, right? And I knew if I didn't cultivate it, I was toast. So I had to get in there and cultivate this. This is 10 days old I had to cultivate it, which is what I do on my vegetables all the time. If I beat the white threads, I'm ahead of the game. At this point, I was behind the white threads, but I had to get into it. This is the uh, CBD crop, uh, 616. So this is, uh, th what the heck, 25, 16 and 5 is how many? 21 days old. All right. Oh, crap. I cultivated that. I got four inches of rain in two hours, four days later. All right. And we ended up with about 10 in the next 12 hours. So I thought, I'm a screw. This is not going to work, right? That is out the window of the truck. There's a little bit of cloudiness there, but it was a pond, and I thought I was done. This is a picture of the vegetable operation from the same event. And the same thing for the CBD. They did a little bit better, but the weeds are real happy, too. You notice? <clears throat> uh, 
a point about this crop that you love if you grow it anywhere, it's a beneficial insect attractor. And it's, in a, it's an aromatic, intoxicating plant before any THC gets in your system, trust me. It's a, it's, it attracts amazing amount of insects. This is after the rain, and I wasn't done. The girls held on. There's some boys in there too, but I just wanted the girls. Right? It, it held on, and I got a uh, kind of a, a uh, the soil crust over pretty rough out there. But you can see the weeds are trying to do what they're doing, and um, I was really happy that in the low spots you can see there in the middle of that photograph, past the emergence point of that seed, I was missing about an inch of soil, but she held on. I thought I got a chance. Again, just another, this is a chronology, so if you're going to, what the heck's going on with these photographs? It's I was doing both things all the time and taking care of eight acres of vegetables. <clears throat> oh, crap again. Weeds, right? Weeds. I started out with a 60-inch mower, went down to a 48-inch mower, then in a 30-inch DR, and then I'm pushing the thing by the time it was over, the 22-inch lawn boy, self-propelled. But, uh, you know, I had to go around those things. You can see the velvet leaf and everything else in there. The pigweed and the lamb's quarter love our farm. I'm um, getting it mowed. The plants are doing okay. This is uh, 624. They've been that's 30 days old after the transplant for the CBD crop. Oh yeah, there's my favorite herbicide again. <clears throat> oh ho! This is uh, 71. This is about 30 days old after the first cultivation. And whenever you cultivate, you put air in the soil, the plants just jump. So they went from that little bitty thing you saw, got all that rain put on them, and then within, uh, forget the days now, but at 30 days, it's over a foot tall. It averaged probably close to, they were 8 to 12 inches tall. But again, I'm all crusted up again from after all that rain. Um, this is now I can put that cultivator in, set that drop wheel and uh, guide wheel, and just drive. Put the hydro high speed and did the whole thing in less than an hour the second time. So this is hard to see. Again, this is a uh, 7.4, just a CBD crop, just having fun. This is really an indoor plant. They're trying to get to grow outdoors. If you try to grow it outdoors, it's, it's an indoor cultivated plant coming from the MJ industry, MJ meaning marijuana. And they're trying to get this thing to grow outside. And it's, some, some of these genetics are just not happy. They don't want to be outside, and they don't like the wind. They have a shallow root mass, typically. We planted these things. We had a lot of moisture. The roots stayed shallow in that nice fluffy bed you saw. When it got dry, there was no water for them, and the wind came, because it's from, from us to Janesville, it's about 15 miles, and it's flat. I guess you'd understand flat in this part of the country, huh? <laughs> Sorry. So the wind's going to blow, and these things growing outside, they're going to need some type of windbreak unless you get a really, unless you grow from seed, perhaps. But it's, it's, it, uh, this is my experience only, and uh, there's probably a, other opinions and or experiences that don't mimic this, but this is what happened to us. It did not want to be outside, and the wind beat the snot out of it. This is 7-7, uh, seven, seven. so this is uh, just about a month old. It's up to my shins, up to my uh, knees. Uh, this is a picture of how not to put a dead furrow in the middle of your field. On the, <laughs> at least that's what I see. This right-hand side here is a dead furrow. I was in a hurry trying to get done. But uh, the crop's pretty much weed-free, and this is the acre that had all the weeds in it. This is the one that had the weed load. Because I used iron cultivation at 30 inches I was able to keep the weeds at bay once this thing got above the weeds all the summer grasses came in and I got you know every grass that come in all, everything was everything was below my seed structure again just a happy plant there's a guy that stored all of his beehives there um, bees like the pollen uh, just a picture of what the cultivation did I got clean rows for a vegetable farmer, really any kind of farmer, you want clean rows and with and with no no pesticides, no herbicides. Just more examples of how that cultivation worked. That's uh, seven seven same time period. Just an idea of you know I cultivate. I know how to cultivate, and it's something that we have to do in an organic production. And that's an example of our vegetable farm. More so. Uh, now that's uh, seven twelve, so that's forty five days old, and it's up to my chest. So after that cultivation, I went from. From that 30 days and two weeks, it's already up to my chest. So it will grow that, that period Brian was talking about. She takes off. This is a picture he mentioned earlier about cultivation or uh, compaction, where see you can see the line there. Well, this was an odd-shaped field, and I didn't want to run on the road, so I kept running back in the same place and made this beautiful, nice seed bed. But it was so fine, right? All the I made it super, super fine. And I thought, I'm going to try this, just see how well, I know what they say, and I'm going to try it. And uh, it seriously affects the growth of that crop. And it wasn't so much tractor uh, 
some of it was wheel tracks, but mostly it was just the fines and the compaction from the rain and the anaerobic type conditions that come from too many fines and not enough, uh, not enough something. Um, first male flowers are seven twelve, so it's about forty five days old, and I got male flowers coming. And we had we had male pollen for eight weeks on this particular crop. This is called Yuma crossbow. I got it from uh, Colorado. It was typically it was originally a feral crop that came from uh, the southwestern parts of Kansas and southeastern parts of Colorado. Just another picture of a crop that's coming along with no weeds. This again is the this is the dead furrow in the middle and a field that should have had a bunch of weeds but the cultivation helped um it is a thirsty crop but it doesn't like wet feet so i learned some things about that this I got two different genetics here the ones on the left is called cherry mom they did not want to be in wisconsin the one on the right is called trace and it, it did much better it grew five foot tall and five foot in diameter just a beautiful plant the efficacy the efficacy of the flowers is amazing i mean it makes you feel good um not in focus but he talked about japanese beetles on the pollen heads i, I call that a japanese beetle orgy i mean i would have 20 30 40 50 beetles on heads all the way through the field just eating pollen uh 716 so again about 45 days old loving life actually i got so excited this crop made me happy it's kind of like a shiny new penny to a raccoon get it Anyhow, this is some this is some of the cherry moms that we grew in the greenhouse. They performed much better. Again, it's an indoor plant. It was grown under plastic. It loved to be there. We also planted some feral hemp. I harvested some feral hemp from around the properties and grew it out. I've got a picture of it, but under in the in the forest where it came from, it wasn't about two foot tall. We put it in the greenhouse in some good soil, and it topped out in the greenhouse in just a short period of time. It also got very sick in the greenhouse. And uh, what's this? This is 7:24, so we're Planted that 6-4, so I'm at 60 days. It's just growing like crazy. Again, at 60 days, I don't have any weeds. I'm happy. Those are all those are all flowers from the male, all that white stuff. Uh, I don't know what's in that one. Just more pollen, more more males. Uh, 70 days. This is August 4th. Again, no weeds. Um, the different the different planting methods. Some talk about yield. This plant grew up and filled in the gaps, shaded out, shaded it out. Uh, I'm starting to get seed formation here. This is uh, eight four, so it's uh, just it's two months old. At sixty days, I got seed heads forming. Uh, just more of the same. This is what it ended up looking like from on top of my truck. Just a beautiful, it just was a beautiful crop. Nice clean rows. Just a beautiful, nice hemp field. Now I don't know what to do there. <clears throat> um, just, just more pictures of something that was really a fun crop to grow. It was, it, uh, I guess it, it was a fun crop to grow. Up to this point, at least. There's more coming. This is a, this is that genetic I call Trace. Um, these are about five foot high. They're chest high, and with 25 square feet, they're, they're doing pretty well. You can also see the wind is blowing heavily right now because they're getting all pushed around. Just another picture of the same. In the background is that other genetic, reasonably healthy, but uh, much smaller. Uh, we added the typical fertility to our vegetable operation because I broadcast stuff every spring, get it ready, but it didn't do much else beyond that. Those those ones on the far side there were kind of sick, and we gave them a foliar a couple times to kind of to give them a little bit of a help. They They said thank you for about five days and went back to being ugly. I'm serious. All right, this is just a perspective. There's my there's my uh, weed eater or my 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 weed control. Uh, there's the there's the cherry mom and there's the trace. So a significantly difference in genetics. Genetics are critical to what you're going to do. And uh, I the props I've I've got a lot of got a props got a lot of props for this panel because they they spoke a lot of good things. And genetics are important and don't listen to anybody until you check their sources. Man, there's a bunch of BS out there. This wasn't a, I didn't get BS'd on this. This thing did well in Colorado. I just didn't want to be here. Uh, another phenomenon that I encountered was right there in the middle is a leopard frog. Is that what they're called? The amphibians on the farm were just amazing. They loved being around the hemp. This is before it got, this is before it matured. Uh, I think it's due to the insects. There's a toad in there, I think. Now, what the hell am I looking at? 
I don't know. I'm too close. Oh, there's a toad right there. It's camouflage. So toads and the toads and amphibians, man. Uh, this is starting to get to be. This is this is this is the cherry mom just unhappy. Well, it needs nitrogen, or well, it needs this, or well, it needs that. Well, right next to it, something was just fine. So it may have needed something else, but I, I really balk against a plant that's going to save the plant that needs three, four thousand dollars an acre of fertility. Really? Uh, if let's find the stuff that grows well and doesn't cost me a bunch of money. In an indoor grow, sure, take care of it, grow your flowers, do what you got to do, and that's wonderful. But in the outdoor realm, when the sun's traversing across the sky and Mother Nature screams at you and you got to do something, I don't really have all the time and energy to give all this money into this plant. I want to find ones that grow well here. This one didn't. I'm not going to grow it again. Uh, this is that sick fl hemp. This is that feral crop that was in the greenhouse, and it was got sick. I covered nafords in, the, in that greenhouse. I really just horrible damage. So we thought, let's put it outside. This is an example of the roots I pulled out of one of those. Um, uh, it's a sweet white root. You'd wash those off and chew on them. They're sweet as can be. Um, there is the ladybugs moving in. Within a couple of days, those plants were covered in ladybugs. They saw the food source and they moved in. That little blur there on the bottom is uh, the the nymphs and the, of the uh, ladybugs. Cherry mom starting to flower. This is August 8th. This is another critical part about your genetics. Ask people when the photo period start. Most of them won't be able to answer you. Well, I want I've got a barn that'll dry 5,000 plants, so you can only grow 5,000 plants. Not unless you grow a plant that'll actually start flowering two weeks before another genetic. So I can grow 10,000 plants if I can stagger my harvest. But you can't stagger your harvest unless they flower at different times. And a lot of folks don't know that. Most of it comes from the indoor grower. They're in some valley. So it's sometime in August or sometime in September. This one started flowering in the beginning of, Oct of August. The trays didn't start flowering until September 2nd. Well, in my part of the country, my first frost is October 5th, and I got a 50-day flower. Rut row, right? I may have a couple frosts on that baby before she's ready. Okay, thankfully, we went through two 25-degree nights on that other flower, and it did fine, right? It didn't wilt. Some, like, you can put lettuce and stuff out in the field, and then you get a couple 25-degree nights. It's no big deal, and that particular genetic didn't wilt. Others will have crops go through a, a frost, and they're done. This again, this is uh, 810, just, a, a just, I would walk through that field and I'd come out smiling, right? It, it was this tall, I'd come out covered in pollen, which I'll talk about in a minute. Well, I'll tell you right now, I would, I would walk this crop and just come out yellow, right? It was a lot of fun. But then I'd make the dumb mistake of walking around my other field, right? And I didn't, re I was, duh, right? I was, I was probably too giddy from leaving this one. I'd get in that field. There's a likelihood. There's feral hemp around me, yeah, so pollen's in the air. But there's a likelihood I wore the same sweatshirt for three days in a row. Yeah, I do that. And, uh, right? Come on. <clears throat> it's on the back porch. It's where you put it on and take it off, right? So I probably got covered in pollen and pollinated some of my CBD crop. This is, uh, yeah, August 10th. These things started flowering at 30 days, so I'm already... I'm already five weeks into a, a, a pollen, pollination. The monarchs thrived on it. They, they, they were all over this crop. Uh, this is the grain head off that sick feral plant that was in the greenhouse. Ladybugs come in, cleaned it up, and it made this beautiful grain head. There's more ladybugs just enjoying life. They, they love this plant. Uh, this is August, thir August 13th. Um, 75 days old, and I got seeds. I just pulled the seed head off, brought it to the house, wanted to look at it. There were some mature seeds in there, but it's very, very early in the stage of, of the plant. Maybe 5% of them were ready. It's, I think Brian mentioned it's an indeterminate seed head, so the bottom's going to be ready. The middle the middle's going to be just a little... The bottom's going to be overly ripe. The middle's going to be perfect, and the top, you're going to wish you didn't have to harvest. <laughs> oh, boy. It's it's hot. So I got an 18-inch. That, that particular variety has got about an 18 to 20-inch uh, seed head on it. Again, so we're now in the middle of August, and so the broadleaves are starting to come in. But this crop is six feet tall. Who cares? Right? Just an example of how tall it is. Just doing some yard maintenance before the field trip. We had a bunch of field trips on the farm. Uh, this is the cherry mom still in flower. 816, so she's two weeks into making flour here. This was a fun day. This is a bumblebee hanging on with one leg. 
She's just hanging on with one leg, filling her pollen sacs. She, all, her, all her legs are filling her pollen sacs while she just hung there, and she flew around until she could barely fly. So it's a really beneficial plant for insects. Um, this is again. This is now the middle of August, and the, the Japanese beetles are just covering the pollen. Uh, I can't see that. Oh, there's a honeybee in there somewhere. Can you see the honeybee? Yeah, they're they're enjoying the pollen. So by this time of year, there's an awful lot not an awful lot of pollen out there from trees and things that they get it from. So these girls were filling up their hives with with hemp pollen in the middle of August. We had we 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 had a lot of fun. Uh, Channel 12 in Wisconsin came by four or five times. We did some field days just to try to promote an industry and meet people that could tell us better ways to do things. Uh, that's oh that has nothing to do with hemp. But it's one of my favorite pictures. That's the Brackenhead wasp taking care of my tomato house from the hornworms. Anybody ever seen a tomato hornworm? Yeah. The white things are the eggs that are growing the Brackenhead wasps that consume the hornworm. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, maturing seed head. This is 824. Again, more more monarchs all over the field. I guess I put that picture in twice. Okay, now this is cherry mom in flower in middle of August. This is a different phenotype, just a tall, giant green plant in that hemp field, the uh, industrial hemp field that I grew. More ladybugs. Uh, yeah, more ladybug nymphs. You see them on there? They just, if you want ladybugs on your farm, use them as a trap plant or around your vegetables or something. They come. Because this hemp plant also attracts the bad ones. Otherwise, the good ones wouldn't want to be there. The nymph, the, uh, the a lot of uh, uh, aphids, especially, Oh, I'll get into this too. This is uh, this is the trace, no flowers. This is the near the end of August, and this genetic has no flowers yet. And the other one's been going for almost three weeks. Uh, that's a ligus bug, I think. I just have that in there to remind me to, to ask somebody what the hell that bug is, because it does put holes in the leaves on the hemp. This is an example. This here, this is. This is the type of thing I got a nice big healthy plant without not a not without really without a outdoor root structure get knocked around by the wind just snapped it right off there at the base um we're looking at the, near the end of August that plant's still not flowering, but you can see some of the ones are getting pushed around they're 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 uh, about seventy percent of those two hundred and some odd plants we grew were excellent the other twenty percent the twenty thirty percent were fair. In the foreground here, amongst my wonderful weed patch, you'll see some of those other cherry moms. Uh, got potency tests at this point. It is critical if you're gonna if you're gonna grow this crop, you have to know when the flowering starts, and if you have to comply with a test, make sure you get it tested at about two weeks into flower. You're probably gonna pass your test. I saw something about your Illinois law. They're gonna come at five. Day, they're gonna give you five day warning. You're gonna be in big trouble if they come when they want to. If it, if you don't pick this. If you don't pick this flower and this crop at the right time, you're going to be hot. There's very few, if any, genetics out there that are not going to be hot if they go past the premium flowering point. They will go hot. Agreed, anybody? Yeah, they'll go hot. So it's it's a it's a very careful thing you have to navigate with your uh, flowering period and your department of ag who's going to come and do the testing. You need to pay attention to when this thing's flowers. If you think you're going to, you set up a scheduled date to flower and you're three days past the premium flowering period, you will have hot buds up in smoke. No high, really. <laughs> uh, this is a, these are brittle branches too. This plant doesn't have a really strong branch structure. What is this? Wind damage, yeah. Another, I got those out of order. Just another, just another potency test. This is uh, 828. I still got about a month of growing to go. They're getting heavy. They're not lodging yet, but they're these. Anything in the field was fine. Anything near the edge of the field was looking for sunlight or just heavy, mostly heavy. Um, cherry mom, September 2nd, putting on some flower. Whew. Right now, what? I guess we have to wait for the frost. Um, the cherry moms at the same time period, you know, healthier flowers, but nowhere near complete. 
Just another picture of one of my favorite places to be that year. I went out there every couple of days and took pictures. Uh, yeah, flowering again, September 2nd. Uh, this is now getting to a place where this is probably the field. They've got some ragweed in front here and some other things coming in, some polypoidum. Is there a better name for polypoidum? I don't know what they call it, but I got a bunch. The weeds are coming in that one field that had all the weed load before, but everything I want is way above this. Uh, this is DATCAP, Department of Agricultural Trade, Consumer Protection, Wisconsin, coming out and doing the test. Big plants. Really happy about those. Very vegetative. This is uh, September 5th. They've only been flowering for a few days. I'm probably in pretty good shape for THC. Guaranteed. Just another picture of my favorite place. This is that feral hemp I was telling you about. That stuff I showed you that grew all the way up. This is feral hemp that I found in a friend's neighbor, you know, neighboring field that's been used for cattle pasture for a while. Harvested a bunch of seed and grew it out. Um, in between getting things mowed on time. But just Again, these pictures are to show you the difference in the genetics. I got beautiful colas and heads on these plants. These cherry moms, but they're small. That, again, is a seed head from that uh, from that uh, feral crop that went was uh, sick. This was a project of love that I started years ago when I was doing grain. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to harvest this uh, industrial hemp with this girl. <laughs> People thought I was crazy, and they were probably right. right. I can't get the head high enough, and I did enough patches on that concave that it would only take so much abuse. And uh, I, was, I was pitching out wads. I mean, for some reason, these photographs are all upside down. Is there something wrong with your computer, Phil? Um, but th there's... There's there's a seed that came out. This is nine nine. I still got about twenty five days before I get this crop in the, but I was testing out that all crop. That's an Alice Chalmers all crop from nineteen fifty three. Um, I, I, I I'm bringing in way too much material. It's really the wrong crop for this uh, for that machine. If a, a, a smaller crop. That's one of the best seed and cleaning machines out there, in my opinion. I've run so much grain to that type of equipment. But for hemp, the fiber just eats you up. You have no choice. You, have, you really have no chance other than to stop every couple of rows and clean something out of there. I, I damn near, I, that's, a, that's a small picture of what was in there. That whole cavity was filled up with fiber a few times. So I kept trying to get as many seed heads as I could, and uh, I shouldn't have. All right, that's what the bin looked like on that first test. A little bit too much lumber in there. Those are all the bast fibers you see pretty much. Uh, this is, uh, we had a lot of, uh, septoria. It's a, it's a fungus and we talked about how wet it was this year. Septoria, septoria will eat this plant up. If there's another, we send it in for pathology and, um, there's, it's basically septoria. Since we're a vegetable operation, I got septoria everywhere on the field, on the farm anyway. Uh, we're 9-11, no inference there. This is just the day I took the picture of the two different genetics. Uh, here's an example of a pest that I haven't heard anybody mention much of. It's called the European hemp borer. You, excuse me, the Eurasian hemp borer. And uh, I'm working with DATCAP. What they do is, it's a little pernicious bug, no bigger than the one in your the meal moth that comes out of your green, your closet. And uh, it's not a good flyer, but they've survived in this region since hemp's been in the, on the planet. And those little but those little <clears throat> those, those bugs, they'll, climb, they'll burrow in, live inside your stem, and eat what you're trying to harvest to make oil from. That's a bud that's been eaten by the hemp borer. I got in touch with DATCAP, which is the agriculture entomology department, and um, said, I want to help figure out how to take care of this bug. So they, all the entomologists went through their laboratories to find examples of it, and they can only find samples of this bug from 1943 in their laboratories and their, in their collections. So I took dozens and dozens of pictures, and I said, here, let's figure this girl out because I want to get rid of it or at least mitigate it. But this is the kind of damage that bug will do. It took out half this particular genetic. It was a stress genetic. It was unhappy. It flowered early. It probably drew the moths in, but it ate it. Ate it. It, 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 it ate more than half that particular genetic. This is, cherry. this is one that the bugs didn't get to, but I guarantee you there's some of them bugs are in that stem. Uh, just more pictures. That's a cucumber beetle hanging out. Uh, this is flowering again. This is about a week into flowering on that genetic. 
Strange things happen. It starts to flower. Other leaves die. Oh, no, the plants are going yellow. Well, they're supposed to at some point. Um, but it's not uniform through the field, so there's little microclimates going on there. There's different things going on with the genetics, I think, or that the plant themselves, how they were cloned, when they were cloned. There's there's so many variables. Uh, again, just more root damage. This is harvest day of the cherries. Just lop them down. All your work starts, but 80% of your expense is going to come when you put the lopper to the first plant. In the uh, the hanging, the drying, the shucking, just pictures of the trichomes. This is the cherry mom, the, the oil glands on that plant. Um, that's Janet, my partner, and we're harvesting the cherry moms there. Cherry mom again. This is one method we tried, cutting off little branches and laying them out. Well, we soon ran out of space in our greenhouse. Um, that is the larva of the Eurasian hemp borer, and those are dipples on a paper towel. I wish I had laid something down there, but that's what it is. So as soon as we're, we're like, yay, we got flour. Hey, what's this freaking little thing, right? It's alive. Oh, crap. Well, that's when we discovered those things existed. Um, shield bugs or uh, stink bugs. Is that the marmonated, mar marmonated stink bug? Yeah. They like the hemp, too. When I cleaned the seed, I had hundreds of those things in my seed. This is, we put a uh, shade cloth on our greenhouse. We cure our onions in there as well. The onions are gone. We started ha putting hemp on trays, started hanging it in there. This was a pretty small crop of small plants. So we could do it in a 20 by 70 greenhouse, put them all in there. We have humidity control. I got fans. I got heat. Uh, that right there is a picture of the beginnings of the destruction of a bud. There's a Eurasian hemp borer in the end of there, and there it is. So if you start seeing terminal growth looking like that little brown spot in the end of it, you're going to find one of them little buggers in there. It's the Eurasian hemp borer, not the European corn borer. Uh, these are the trays in full flower. Just, just a beautiful plant. Again, enjoying life. One thing I do want to mention, that the males are there, and the dry stalks are what give you all the grief. So you do want to harvest as, with as much green matter as you can. But all that brown in there are dead males, and that's the frickin' fiber that eats your lunch and your bearings and your shafts. And anything else you put in that field that's moving. All right, just a beautiful crop. This is uh, 922. I got about a week before I try to get in there. Just loving life. Um, there's some white mold issues right there. The sclerotinia. I didn't find that out until Brian showed me his picture. I thought, dang it. Actually, when I got this stuff in the grain bin and the moisture came, around, came in around the edge of the bin, I had white mold growing. So I knew I had it. I just didn't know what it really looked like in the field. Again, just, just a rookie. Um, that's the seed that comes off that, that particular head. Just, it's a mess. It's done. And it's full of mold. That one's mature, ready to go. More flowering trays, just more pictures of this is about ready to go. This is 923. No, nope, there again, I'm bringing the stuff in there, beating up my combine. But it cleans seed really nicely. There's my other favorite friend, my 191890 Clipper 2B, or whatever they are, you know, turn of the century. That's how I cleaned all that seed. Um, it, it, it's, a, it was a beautiful crop. That's the, so, that's the temperature of the tailings that came out of my first cleaning just overnight. That says that's 134, 134 was overnight. 119 was within hours after I got it out of that seed from that first cleaning. So she gets hot fast. So 80, 87 degrees was the part was clean seed, the first cleaning. So that's still at the, that's still at the limit of too hot for, uh, oxidizing your oils. There is the pupated European, Eurasian hemp borer, excuse me. So when they turn orange like that, they're getting ready to get you next year. That's what they're doing. Very, very oily crop. I, I hit it too hard, ran it through the concave too fast, broke open all those seeds. That is oily, oily, oily hemp hearts and, and shells. Um, that's just a small snippet of what I had. That all, that, that all crop could not handle that fiber. That thing wrapped around the bearings and I smoked them. It's a very resinous plant. Your concaves are going to get covered. That's nearly a smoke bearing. And that, if you go one direction, everything's cool. You turn around, the wind's blowing the other way. You go, oh, shit, I better, oh, oops, I better stop, right? Another thing that happened to me that between the harvest and with that machine and I borrowed a uh, International 1420 was the migration of the goldfinch showed up. And if the birds show up in your field, you're too late. There were tens and tens of thousands of goldfinch, and they knocked off. I'm gonna. I guesstimate they knocked off 50% of my seed, and they were feeding the morning doves. Right? They love this seed. Now, 
I, that, that's my cover crop of hemp. There's the 1420 I borrowed. Had to fix that before I used it because it was in mothballs. And then that's the all crop side by side. Some of those dots are birds. It was a gray flush. It looked like the field was alive when I was harvesting that thing. I only took two rows at a time because that thing could only swallow so much. And the fiber, I had to stop. You guys drive a combine and you got that hum, right? Mm, it's just doing what it does. When the hum changes, you shut her down, right? When, if that hum changes or the vibration is doing something, shut her down. Well, when I did four rows the first pass, I had to shut her down because something got clogged up. I know guys that had $800,000 John Deere's and they had uh, $10,000 N6's and they both plugged them. It didn't matter. You go too fast, you put too much. Don't be in a hurry to get this crop. That's just me looking silly. I pulled that out of there twice. That's the final. That came off the final drive shaft on the feed chute. And it did come out of that little hole. I didn't dismantle the whole combine, although I wished I had. All right there's my cover crop again, and that that's not any, that that came out, <laughs> and, and after about half the crop was on, I had to do that again. These old combines are not as good as some of the newer combines I hear. I've never had a new combine, but <laughs> there's my tools. <laughs> that right there is what I got it out with. Just reach in there, hook it, hook it down to the shaft, and I could pull it out. Um, Knives, I tried all kinds of things. So there's my cover crop. The birds gave me a cover crop of hemp. This is one of my favorite things. Before I was done, I bowed. Lady Hemp does not give up her crop without a tussle or, ob or obeisance. You must obey. She will rule. I wasn't kidding. I had to bow because it took me a long time. That's the team. This is a uh, trays in flower. It's now the end of September. It's 30 days in flower. It's about a 45 to 50 day crop. I know I'm getting close to hot. Um, there's the grain. This is, I started to harvest that combine. I couldn't get it. Once I got it to the house is when the work began. I was up till, I was up 20 hours at a time trying to keep this stuff from getting hot. I didn't, I only ended up with about 400 pounds an acre. I'm sure I had probably 800 to 1,000 pounds an acre before things go. Phil's going to shut me down. All right, there's how big the plants were. There's what's left. That's the entrance point of the hemp borer. You can come up and get me. That's what they do inside the stem. Um, this is a friend in Colorado growing, drying their stuff. There's a trichomes. There's something. There's where it's wrapped around a shaft. Some of the flower we got off those plants. That's what happens when you shuck it without gloves. It's a very oily, resinous plant. Um, shuck bud ready for harvest or ready for processing. More of my cover crop. Now this is something that I know Mr. Davies mentioned about, and I is this crop. The, the hardest part about dealing with this was when it came time to sell it. And when I found out the farmers are still getting the farmers are getting twenty cents a gram for a finished oil product, right? Retail, if they're going to buy my wholesale product out of the field, they're going to pay me 20 to 50 cents a gram. When the retail value is probably close to 100, 80 to 100 now. So I said, where the hell is that $90.70 going? Right? To somebody else again. So I'm driving around the field with steam coming out of my ears going, why is this happening again? Why am I letting this happen again? So I developed this little organization here. And it's the Farmers United Cannabis Union. And I'm only selling t-shirts and hats right now. But if we figure out what to do, let's do it. Right, the byline, I'm probably not going to repeat in public company, but there's, a way, there's two different ways to pronounce. If you beat me on price, it's F-U-C-U for short. Stand up for what's right and don't let them take your money from you, man. This crop's got a lot more valuable to humans. The seeds belong to the people, and I think the plants belong to the people. Now I'm preaching. All right. If it gets commoditized, which it's going to need to be for some types of crops later, but the premium value of this plant being a medicine and healthy for us, stand your ground. Don't let people take your money from you. How do you develop your markets? That's a whole other story, right? There's there's a lot there's a lot involved in that. Where we uh, as a vegetable grower, we got five or six different markets already. We only grew a little bit. I didn't have thousands of pounds waiting to be going somewhere. Um, the 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 forecast for some of the pricing on this hemp flower is ridiculous. It's down to ten cents a gram. There's still so now now it's seventy bucks a gram instead of seventy bucks instead of eighty bucks a gram retail. There's still sixty seven eighty dollars on the table that somebody else is getting. The processes are the gatekeepers. Okay, I'm going to shut up because Phil wants to get moving. All right. Thank you. <clears throat>